It is no secret that I own a lot of books, and a lot of these books are unread. Now, I love having my own library and a good stack of TBR books, but when I take a deep dive into my shelves, I have books that are literally collecting dust. Books that I forgot I've even owned. Even books that could potentially be a five-star favorite book of all time, but I haven't read it yet. Now, this series is not me going on a book buying ban. It's not me unhauling hundreds of books for the sake of shrinking my TBR pile. It is, however, giving the forgotten books a chance to become a favorite, figuring out if certain books deserve to take up space on my shelves. I'll be using a TBR jar to select five books, and before the month is up, if any of the five books haven't been read, they must be unhauled. The end goal of this challenge is to have shelves crammed with favorite books. Books that I'll want to reread, share with my friends, or even to pass down to my children one day. So, I'm also giving myself the rule that if the book doesn't fit that criteria, it must also be unhauled. Now in the end, ideally, I'd like my physical TBR to be able to fit on this cart. So we have some work to do. I started this challenge with 754 unread books. Welcome to my bookshelf ultimatum. Hey y'all, what is up and welcome to my new series. So I have been thinking a lot about my library lately and how I really want it to feel when I walk in here, how I want it to look, how I want it to be for when other people come in here and they're like, oh, have you read this book? No. Have you read this book? No. What is this book about? Don't know, haven't read it. I just, I want to have a library that when I look at it, when other people look at it, I can fully with my whole heart my full chest recommend that book because I loved it so that being said I kind of came up with this challenge this ultimatum of sorts that I'm gonna have to read these books that I pull from this jar in this set amount of time or they've got to go slash if the books don't reach my criteria of being a favorite being a book I want to reread being a book that I would recommend etc it also has got to go because in the long run, I want to have well-loved shelves, well-read shelves, shelves that just scream me. <laughs> Now this is not a book buying ban. I don't plan on not ever buying books. I do plan on, however, minimizing the amount that I buy because I'm not gonna ever get through this massive TBR pile if I'm overly buying, you know what I mean? So from here on out, I'm just gonna be a little bit more mindful about my shopping. It's not gonna be a ban, nay nay, because that just sounds pretty depressing if you ask me. Now I know what you're thinking, Beth, you bring in more books, plus you have 700 plus books on your shelves, only reading five books a month, it's gonna take literal decades for you to get to where you wanna get to, nay nay, because I also will be reading other books throughout the month, and some may very well come from my shelves. They just won't have like an expiration date. They won't have that ultimatum thing. I can just pick and choose. If I don't feel like reading it, I can put it back. For instance, I have a readathon that I'm gonna be doing in April, and some of the books that I'll be reading for that readathon will come from my shelves. Or if I want to do a reading vlog of reading all witchy books in a week or I don't know, you know, I will read some of those from my shelves, but I can also read some from the library, some from the Everend app, some from whatever. So I'm really hoping this doesn't take decades. I'm hoping I can get it done within the next couple of years. I'm hoping that this challenge forces me to pick up books that would probably still be sitting on my shelves for years to come and you know, decide, is this book really something that I want to read? Is this book something that once I read it, I love it? Is this book worthy of sitting on my shelves? You get it? I hope you get it. I hope all of that makes sense, but we will continue to work out the tweaks as we go along. But in order for me to get started, I've got to pick some books. So I'm going to pick five books out of this TBR jar. As books do come in, I will add them to the jar. And if I pull a book out of the jar and I've already read that book, I will just redraw. Or if I pull a series out of the jar, that means I only have to read whatever installment that I'm on at the time. And then I put that tap back in the jar and hopefully pull it again another month. But that is that. I'm gonna shake this up. And we're gonna draw our first five books. 
So this episode is going to end at the end of March and it is March 19th. I'm starting this way late for the month. And so I have a little less than two weeks to read five books. I'm really hoping that it doesn't give me some tomes, you know? Like, don't let it be House of Leaves. <laughs> don't let it be House of Leaves. Okay, so watch it be House of Leaves. It's not gonna be House of Leaves. Too Good to Be True is our first pick. Ah, oh, it's a book of the month choice too good to be true by Carola Lovering I don't even know what this is about but I guess we will find out in this vlog all right book two book two so actually let's pull from the bottom salt and stone this is a book that I've actually read the first book, but I read it like 10 years ago. So, do I want to read, this is a series. Do I want to read the first book in the series again? Or do I want to just pick up, let's read the first book in the series again. Yeah, okay, because I've read Fire and Flood, and I want to reread it before I read this, because I read this over 10 years ago, I have to add two to this list. But uh, let's go ahead and pick our third book. Be easy on me. In Defense of Witches. In Defense of Witches. This was actually a book that was sent to me. This is In Defense of Witches, The Legacy of the Witch Hunts and Why Women Are Still on Trial. So is this a nonfiction? I don't know, but I am obsessed with this cover. I really hope I enjoy this one. So that's three books, four really, but three from the drawer. All right, book number four. The Night the Lights Went Out. Is this a Mary Kubica? book. I think this is a Mary Kubica book. Ah, no, that's when the lights go out. The night when the lights went out. I don't, I have no idea what this book even looks like. I'm gonna have to look it up on my phone. My phone case is broken. Let's not look at that. Oh, the book that I bought because it looked like Taylor Swift. Wow, Beth. I've had this on my shelves since 2020, I believe it was. <laughs> the night the lights went out and I bought this because this girl right here literally looks like Taylor Swift. So I, it's about time I get to this because I've had this on my shelf for four years now. One more, we're doing good so far. We're doing good so far. I was really terrified I was gonna get like a tome um, or something that's gonna take me way, like the stand, <gasps> you know? Night Will Find You. This seems like another thriller. Night Will Find You. I think this is kind of new, so that's exciting. I think this is a newer book, let's see. 2023, so this is a newish thriller. Best-selling author of We Are All the Same in the Dark. I don't know, but this is our fifth book. So this stack is not bad, considering I only have a little less than two weeks to get these read, so really quick. Here's our full stack. And if I don't read these books before the end of March, we've got to get rid of them. So let the reading begin. Okay, it is time to officially start our book. It is the next day. Beth, time is ticking. Time is ticking. You have less than two weeks to get six books read. Six books. And in all of February, I read six books in the entire month. But I feel like we're getting our groove back. So. So I have read six books this month so far. So we're looking, it's looking okay. It's looking, it's looking okay. It's looking okay. So on my stack of six books, the two that I would be the most upset with getting rid of is of course the Victoria Scott duology. I have read Fire and Flood, like I said about 10 years ago. I was obsessed with this book. It is kind of like Hunger Games meets Pokemon in a way. There's this competition thing with a prize at the end that our main character really needs to save her younger sibling. And it is YA. There is romance in here. It's 
YA though. So I do miss it and I really want to dive in so I can finally read the second half of the competition because you don't figure out who wins the competition by the end of it. Like this is the first half of the competition. This is the second half. So I really don't know. You know what I mean? But there are no audiobooks to either of these two books and today I really want to get stuff done around the house so I'm gonna save these for maybe this weekend. I'm gonna be so upset with myself if I don't get to those and I have to unhaul those. I'm just, just saying. So out of the other books that I have, I have two thrillers, one witchy book, whoa, and then one I think is like a mystery book. Like it gives like big little lies vibes, but here's the other four. I do have two other books that I want to read that are by this author. So this is Too Good To Be True by Carola Loverling. I just hauled By Baby, which is her newest book and it sounds so good. I think I'm gonna start with this book. I'm gonna get a little ways into it and then I will tell you what is about what I know more. Like I like to do that versus just reading the synopsis, you know? I feel like I understand it more. You know, you get it, you get it. Okay, let's get started. You're just too good to be true and take my eyes off of you. Wait a minute, I'm already confused. I am on chapter two and I'm a little thrown off there. So chapter one, we have the perspective of Skye and she wakes up in the morning. Her boyfriend of six months is downstairs and he's asking her like what kind of eggs does she like and she's like over easy and then he's like hey babe what kind of eggs do you like and she's like dude I said over easy and then he's like did you say over easy and she's like why we've been together for six months he makes me breakfast all the time he knows how I like my eggs what's going on so she's getting all really nervous and stuff lo and behold he was nervous too because boop he popped the question he brings up her breakfast in bed gets on one knee pops the question and like in her inner monologue she's saying stuff like you know my best friend thinks it's kind of weird because he doesn't have family I've never met none of his family okay so that's like chapter one and they're getting ready to go to brunch with her dad his wife her kids whatever so okay <laughs> And he's like 40 something years old. Like she mentions that he's 40 something years old, okay? So we go on to chapter two and it's the diary entries of said boyfriend who's been married for 25 years to a wife and has grown kids that are like in college and stuff. And he's going through marriage counseling and the marriage counselor is the one who told him to write this journal, which is why I'm confused because in chapter one, he's literally getting engaged. In chapter two, he's been married to her. So I think it's time I need to read some of this synopsis. Blah, 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 blah. Except Burke isn't who he claims to be and interspersed letters to his therapist reveal the truth. He's happily married and using Sky for his own deceptive ends. In a third perspective, a set 30 years earlier, a scrappy 17 year old named Heather is determined to end things with Burke, a local bad boy. Okay, so we're getting Sky's perspective, the diary entries from Burke, and then an earlier perspective of Heather who at that time was just dating Burke. And Heather is Burke's wife of like the 20 something years. On a collision course she doesn't see coming, Sky throws herself into wedding planning as Burke's schemes grow ever more twisted. But of course, even the best laid plans can go astray. And just when you think you know where this story is going, you'll discover there's more than one way to spin the truth. Let's rewind. We're getting Skye's perspective, which Skye is an older lady who is just, I say older lady, she's probably, she's probably around my age. I I'm assuming she's closer to 40 because he's in his 40s at the time, is getting engaged to Burke. And then we get the diary entries of Burke. Huh, who we already don't trust. Mm. And then we get Heather's perspective, which was Burke's, or is Burke's wife? Is he still married and he's like gonna try to get married again? Like what the, okay, okay. I am currently at 25% into this book. And first off, we have officially discovered exactly how this guy is going to be using Sky, you know, as any creepo man would, I guess you would say. Like, we already don't like him. We didn't like him from the get-go. Anyway, so we already know that. And I feel like if we know that, and we know what he's doing, and how he's using her, what's going to be the plot twist? I think the plot twist is going to be maybe she already knows. I don't think she knows. I mean, they're getting married. 
I don't think she knows. Unless she has her own plan, I don't think she knows. But I also think maybe her and Heather, old dude's actual wife, okay? Oh, he's getting married, I thought you said. He is, he is. But he's got a wife and he does. Okay, so the book itself is cut into part one and part two. And we get to part two in the middle of the book. So I have not gotten to part two yet. I'm gonna assume the twist or a twist happens when we go to part two, like kind of in Gone Girl, you know how Gone Girl is split part one and then you find out the twist and then it's part two and it like reads like an entirely different story. I think that might be what's gonna happen with this book. I also feel like Heather, which is his wife, which we're getting to know her in the past, in the 1980s is when her timeline is. We're getting to know her and how her and Burke, that's his name, her and Burke's relationship begins. And then we get the right now in Skye's perspective, which is Burke and her getting married, even though he has a fucking wife. And then we get Burke's perspective, which is taking place during the span of him meeting Skye. So while he is still married with Heather, he loses his job and him and Heather are in desperate need of money. They're in extreme debt. All of their cards are maxed out. Their daughter got in an accident and lost all of her front teeth. She's going to college, a freshman in college. She has to have implants put in. Those are hella expensive. Like they need money. He's lying to Heather and telling her that he has these job interviews that he's going on. And instead of going to these job interviews, he's going to do the nasty with old Sky. So like, how are you pulling in money? <laughs> anyway, men, right? So then he comes up with this brilliant plan, okay? This brilliant plan to solve all of his fucking problems and it makes him even bigger of a scumbag. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. And I have a feeling, I think that Sky and Heather, I think they're connected. And I think I know how they're connected. And it would make sense. But then again, at the same time, how Burke would not know would be weird, maybe? I don't know, like it would seem obvious that he would know. But I'm also always finding myself swimming in the river that is delusion. So I could be completely, <laughs> completely 100% wrong on this. So far I am enjoying it in the sense that I wanna see how this is all playing out. I don't think it's gonna be a five star unless, unless it gets me. Because right now it's reading like a four, it's reading like a good thriller. Is it a thriller? It's a thriller. This is the thing, is normally the thrillers that I wholeheartedly enjoy are thrillers that involve murder. You know, something dangerous. This is not that. So I typically don't like through, I don't know. I like to be, I don't know. I don't know what you would call it, but this is more of like a, as of right now, a domestic, messy type thriller. You know what I mean? But sometimes those, Sometimes those hit, you know, they can hit. Like, The Last Mrs. Parish. Love that one because that twist, I mm, made it a favorite. Even though, like, I liked it before because I hated that man so much with a fucking passion I could have dove into that book. And, oh, how the turns have tabled. Because let me tell you what, I have officially hit part two in the book. We're at, like, 46% in the book. There wasn't a twist or anything revealed, but it goes from part one because part one, old Berkey Burke, nasty, rusty, dusty, crusty Burke had this like thing where my dog just opened the door. Hi Kaiser. Had this thing where he was going to be using Sky essentially. And I'm not gonna tell you how. I'm gonna leave that for you to find out if you decide to read the book. So we're going along poor Sky, cause like really, Poor Sky. Sky has now found out that Burke is a scum dillium bag. Okay, so now it's part two. And I really hope that this author brings us the drama, brings us the revenge. I really hope the mup gets stabbed in the throat at this point. You know what I'm saying? And Sky has a best friend named Andy. And Andy hasn't trusted Burke from the get go. And Andy is the one who originally found out about Burke. These aren't really spoilers. I'm not giving away anything major to the story. So just. Okay, so Andy is the one that originally found out about Burke, okay? I really hope, if I'm, if I'm judging Andy right, I really hope Andy throws down and is like, you know what, Sky? I got your back, you got the body bag. You know what I mean? Like, I really hope she's that kind of girl. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> you ever get so frustrated with a book? I just went to go put in the Goodreads, my rating of the book. I'm really surprised, honestly, at the rating for this book and how high it is because this book was fucking stupid. It was so stupid. Part one, I felt like it was going to be this big buildup and then we were going to have part two, this ultimate revenge plot twist go down. That's not what happened, okay? That's not what happened. You do want the twist to be believable and for the most part, especially for a seasoned thriller reader, like it's gonna be really rare to find books that you don't see the twist coming because it's like you've read it, you've read it all essentially, you know what I mean? Okay, so anyway, I'm not mad about the fact that the twist didn't like get me, my jaw didn't drop on the floor, but what pisses me off at the beginning of part two, when the things are like slowly revealed, you have 40, 45 more percent of the book of just telling how how it was all set up. And it literally, what really ultimately pisses me off after going through this boring ass thriller, it ends in a fucking happily ever after. Nobody's murdered, nobody gets in, like it literally ends with a happily ever after type situation. Like what the fuck? Two stars. Two, I'm glad this challenge made me read this so I can get it off my shelf. Two stars, I'm just, <sighs> flustered, frustrated. It was just such a boring, let down kind of book. And that's my thoughts. Normally when I watch people do reading vlogs and they talk about books and like some books up, they have these really big, like thought out, analytical, English lit, paper worthy reviews. When I'm over here just like, the book sucked, the characters were bland. It was a happily ever after in a thriller say, what two stars, the end. <laughs> The book sucked, do not recommend. I am gonna be unhauling it, so. It is a dark and gloomy day today. It is supposed to rain all day long, which is so perfect for sitting down and reading the hot, no, I was gonna say with a hot cup of tea. No, babe, I'm gonna need an Alani new because I am running on zero. Well, okay, probably like two hours of sleep again. One of my kids was just not having it last night. <laughs> comes with the territory. Before I dive in to the next book that I'm gonna pick up, I was laying in bed last night and was thinking about what could potentially happen in future months. What if next month I literally pull three series out of the tub? I said at the beginning of this episode that if I were to pull a series out of the tub, whatever book I'm on that I haven't read yet is the book that needs to be read for the series. I'm changing that. I'm changing that and here's why. Say for example, next month I pull out The Twilight Saga. The only book that I have not read from The Twilight Saga is Break and Dawn. However, I've read Twilight Eclipse and New Moon back when I was a teenager and I haven't read them since okay I haven't read them since I don't even think I've watched the movies since I went and saw them in theater so I don't remember crap I would need to reread Twilight New Moon Eclipse so I would have to read those four books, okay? And then what if the next little tab that I pull out is the Outlander series? I've read books one and two well over 10 years ago, right out of high school. I don't remember anything. I remember the main character's names and I kind of remember like, you know, how she got there and um, you know, some stuff. But I really gotta reread books one and two before I can get, dive into book three. So you're telling me, just from those two pools, I would have to read the entire Twilight Saga, the two Outlander books that I've already read, plus the one that I haven't read yet. So that's seven books just from two pools, you know, and I still have three more pools to do. It's not gonna be doable in me be successful at this. I'm changing it to if I pull a series out of the box. I just have to read one book from that series. If it's a reread, that's fine. I know this whole thing is to get my like unread books read, but a lot of the series that I have on my shelves that are unfinished are series that I started like 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago. So it's just, I'm gonna have to restart them. That's just gonna be the name of the game. So today I am gonna be reading this series, probably not both today because I'm not that fast of a reader anymore, especially because I'm a mom. I'm pretty busy, <laughs> even on days when I don't have to do anything. I am for this video going to read both of these simply because it's a duology and they're pretty short. They're YA. I can read both of these, this is fine. Plus I would just like to get them done, you know? this get this series done once and for all let us go get our little energy drink because uh <laughs> lord knows i'm gonna need it and get started <laughs> okay 
okay so the plot thickens the plot thickens in the sense that i just had lunch okay i had some chicken tenders because those are superior with some white gravy and um it was delicious in case you were wondering while i was eating i was on instagram well first i went to goodreads to add this to my currently reading shelf and then i went to and it has like a four point something oh I got the burps it has like a four point something average rating which is really good okay that's a good rating especially for a book that's written in like 2014 2015 so anyway I went to go look at her post and essentially so like I knew back in the day that there was going to be a third book like I knew that much okay I had no idea until after looking at that Instagram post that this book is left on a big cliffhanger and the entire book is essentially this girl what's her name Tella Tella and her family moved to Montana to kind of get away get some fresh air because her older brother is really sick and they have this thing called the Brimson Bleed where you can go I think it's only for like teenagers or I could be wrong I don't know I don't remember she gets the opportunity to go and if you win this race think of kind of Hunger Games ish race you get a cure and the cure would cure her brother so this is like the first part of the race and then this is the second part of the race but I was reading that the race is not even finished with this book so you don't know who actually wins when you finish this book you would find out who wins in the third book that according to Victoria Scott is not being published anymore I sat there for a little bit and I was like well do I really want to read 600 ish pages though it's probably a really good story and I'm gonna really enjoy it, but it doesn't end. It's left on a cliffhanger. Do you see my issue here? Sadly, I think I'm gonna go ahead and unhaul them because I don't even wanna keep them for my children if my children are gonna be mad at me for giving them an unfinished series. So anyway, that's what we're doing today is we're unhauling these two books and now I need to pick <laughs> something else to read. Like, could you imagine me reading that and getting to the end of Salt and Stone and realizing that that's not even the end of the series? And like there is a romance in there and I was looking through the comments of that post on Instagram and people were even asking her like do they even end up together? Like that's not even answered. What? I just... Mm. Anyway, okay, let's move on. So these are the three books that I have left of this episode. I could start with the shortest just to make sure that I get this one done or I could go with the longest just to make sure I can get I kind of you know what I, I think I'm gonna go with this one first I'm just in a tailor mood you know today is national poetry day and you know it just it makes sense with her new album coming out I'm just I'm gonna read this one and this has absolutely 100% nothing to do with Taylor Swift I'm just saying that because this cover reminds me of like Taylor in her red era <laughs> So I think this is a mystery book. I am gonna read the synopsis here to myself and then get the book started and I will update you once I know more. And I also need to take this pesky sticker off. I am 25% into this book and I'm bored. Literally bored. This book I thought was a mystery. I'm gonna have to, actually let me look on Goodreads and see what it's categorized as. It does have a 4.04 rating so that's promising so it's a fiction mystery southern historical fiction contemporary women's fiction adult romance <laughs> is all the shelves that it is slotted in whatever you want to call it so i'm probably about 100 pages in and okay essentially this book we have this woman very recently divorced and she and her two children they already live in this really small town in Georgia and they move to this cottage that is on the property of this older woman named Sugar. The town itself is called Sweet Apple, Georgia and a long time ago a big portion if not the whole thing but like a very big portion of this town was actually owned by Sugar's 
family. Sugar is the only daughter and they had four boys, three or four boys I believe back then. When her parents were long gone, the boys were there, probably grown men. They were the ones like selling off the property bits by bits and Sugar did not like that. Now Sugar is the only one left and she is hanging on to her property. She is a 93 year old woman. We love that, okay? In this book, what is the name of the lady? I want to keep calling her Marjorie, but it's not. Marilee. So Marilee and our two kids moved into the cabin on Sugar's property. And when they first moved there, Sugar was like, I'm not going to form any bonds with them. We're not going to become besties. We're not going to form a book club. You know, I'm just going to be their landlord and that's going to be that. Well, Sugar slowly realizes, or rather probably more so quickly realizes that that actually is not going to be the case and you're actually going to start forming little bonds with this family. Spurst throughout it, like every couple of chapters, we do get a flashback chapter of when Sugar was a young girl. So this was like 80 years ago and of like things that have happened on the property, things have, that have happened with her family and stuff like that. But anyway, there's also like this little mystery about one of Sugar's brothers that like nobody really knows his life or what happened to him. I don't think that's going to be the mystery of the book. If you hear a little tap tap and Kaiser's walking around. There's also mentioning like of the woods behind the property a few times and there's this dog that constantly comes out from the woods and apparently only the little boy has seen this dog and that's brought up a few times. I don't know if that has anything to do with the mystery or the woods have anything to do with the mystery but then there's a third character. So we get Marilee's point of view. We get flashbacks that are in Sugar's point of view. We haven't gotten Heather's point of view, but she is a prominent character in the book. So Heather is a classroom mom of both of Heather's kids. And coincidentally enough, both of Marilee's kids are in each one of those classes. And so, you know, Heather is a very wealthy woman. Her husband is a doctor. They live in this mansion or what Marilee would say is actually bigger than a mansion. She is the type of woman that has, you know, the clique of women that's constantly following behind her. She has that really like Southern twang going on, the designer sunglasses and the designer handbag and first day of school she like presses the button of her little key fob and her Suburbans thing comes up and there's gift bags all in the back of the Suburban for the kids. She is that kind of mom. Yeah, as of right now, Marilee doesn't really like her or is like, there's no like friend friend. And in the synopsis, it refers to her as a friend. So I don't know if they do because it says Marilee is charmed by the glamorous young mother's seemingly perfect life and finds herself drawn into Heather's world. So there's that. And then the very last paragraph says, in a town like Sweet Apple where sins and secrets are likely to be found behind the walls of gated mansions as in the dark woods surrounding Marilee's house. Appearance is everything, but just how dangerous that deception can be will shock all three women. I don't know what that means, and I haven't gotten to anything. Really, so far, it's just boring. It does kind of feel like I'm watching a movie, maybe a Lifetime movie, or like a movie that you find at Blockbusters that's not in like the popular release section. It probably never went to movie theaters. It probably just went straight to VHS tape. That kind of movie. Okay, wait, <laughs> back up. There is, at the beginning of not every chapter, but almost every chapter, a blog post that has been posted. And this is very similar to Bridgerton or even Gossip Girl in the sense that we don't know who's writing these blogs and they are spilling the tea. Even though this is tagged as a romance, I don't see a romance happening just yet. I do see that Heather's husband, the doctor, was kind of low key, what I feel like hitting on Marilee, which is kind of cringe because literally Marilee is just going through a divorce because her husband was cheating on her. You think it's a good move, Leia? Probably not. As of right now, 25% in, super freaking bored. This might be a DNF. So I ordered pizza from Papa John's, so I'm gonna go. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like all that I've talked about today is food and books. It literally sums up my life. Kids got cheese. We also got a brownie for dessert. And then of yummy, course, yummy. a meat pizza. I just want you to know 
that one, I'm almost done with this blanket. I actually just ordered some white yarn to do a border, but I don't know, maybe one more day of working on it and I'll be done. I also ordered some more yarn to do a book blanket. I started a book blanket at the beginning of the year, but I bought a brand of yarn, hang on. I am so new to crochet that I didn't know this is not the type of yarn you wanna do for a blanket. This is like the yarn you wanna use for, for pot holders or like a coaster. So I think I'm gonna do, make some coasters because I bought like five skeins of different colors to make a book blanket. I ordered five more skeins, different colors of this brand. So this is one of the colors. I'm waiting on the other colors to come in and I'm gonna start my book blanket. And so essentially with my book blanket, for every row, I'm not gonna do this granny square type. I'm gonna do it in rows. And for every row, it'll be a representation of all the books that I read this year. So all the five stars will be one color. All of the four stars will be one color. The three stars will be one color for the entire year. And I normally average about 100 books a year. I'm hoping it makes it big enough for a full blanket. That's exciting. So I'm waiting for those to come in from Joann's and I can get started on my book blankets. But anyway, I am 40% into this book, not even 50% because I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna tell you this right here right now. There's literally nothing happening in this book. I feel like we're just reading about these people living their daily lives and, and it's so boring. Even like the past, the past chapters when we're going back, you know, 80-ish years into Sugar's childhood, those chapters are boring and sad and nothing else is going on. They're just like, the kids are going to the movies and they're going to a little meeting for the school right now. It's like we're 40% in and the romance hasn't even started. Like nothing is happening. And honestly, it's torture. I just keep thinking about other books and I'm not invested in this story. I don't care about these characters. There's nothing happening. I'm almost 200 pages in and nothing's happening. This is the part of the video where I tell you that I am DNFing it. I just, I can't, I cannot. And I feel bad because I feel like every single book that I have read or tried to read or picked for this video so far, either the book has sucked or it sucks because I can't, like the series isn't finished. So there's really no point in reading the series at all. And like the series is probably never going to be finished and it's left on the cliffhanger. So like literally what is the point? But I'm just, I'm not, I cannot sit through. I'm listening to it on audio and it is like a 15 hour long book. I still have nine and a half hours left. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm DNFing it. I feel sad because I really love the cover of this book. I bought this book in 2020. And imagine if I did not do this challenge, this book would probably still be sitting on my shelves unread five years from now. So I will pick up the next book tomorrow and hopefully, hopefully it'll be a good one. It'll be a good one. I mean, I don't feel like this week is wasted because like this challenge is literally doing its job and we're getting rid of books that don't bring us joy. I need y'all to be so for real with me right now because, because I was searching on Pango Books for a book, obviously, and I noticed that, because like this is my toxic trait, one of them, <laughs> that when I find a book that I need off Pango Books, nine out of 10 times, I will scroll that same seller's page because, you know, I don't like a book to travel alone. So I'll scroll that same seller's page to see if I can't find something else to add into the box. Well, I found a seller that had quite a bit of like Stephen King books, right? So I was like, okay, I need this one, this one, this one, this one. And then as I was looking, she had like over 3,000 books. Props to you, babe. That is a lot to keep up with. I could never, especially because she sent it the next day after I ordered it, slay. To the point, Beth, I was looking in her store. People are literally, literally selling annotated books, okay? Like annotated copy of Shatter Me, annotated copy of Beach Read, annotated copy of Akatar for $50, $75. If y'all wanted to buy my annotated books, just tell me. If you say, <laughs> If you see me throwing up annotated copies of Happy Place in my pango, mind your business or buy the book. One or the other. One or the other, because babe, I got bills to pay. 
Anyway, so I started a new book this morning and it really, really pains me to say that it's probably not going anywhere and it's probably gonna continue to live on my shelves because I am really enjoying this book so far. I actually have made a pretty decent dent. I did not wanna stop. I just, okay, listen, hear me out. Hear me out and just, you're gonna have to like let it stretch a little bit, okay? In the sense that this book reminds me of Charmed, but with like out being a witchy book. I don't know, you're just gonna have to go with it. Okay, you're gonna have to go with it. So this book follows a woman named Vivi. Vivi, what is her day job? She is an astrophysicist. She's a scientist, right? She looks at the stars and all of this. She believes in science, okay? But there's one little thing. When Vivi was a little girl, she kind of saved her best friend's life. At the time, he was not her best friend. Once she like saved his life, he has since become her best friend. How did she save his life, you ask? She had a vision. <laughs> that he was gonna get killed by a blue horse, okay? And so like every day, she was probably like 10, 11 years old, she would sit on her porch and she would wait for him because he was a little older than her to walk to school because every day he would pass in front of her house and she would try to warn him multiple, multiple times like, yo, you're gonna get killed by a blue horse. You know, don't come this way anymore, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Lo and behold, <laughs> One day he's walking in front of her house and a blue Mustang comes roaring its engine, speeding down the road and goes off the side of the street and almost hits him, but little old Vivi, you know, saved his life. And she wound up in the hospital cause like broke her leg or something like that. Ever since then, they have been best friends. And Vivi's mom was an actual psychic. She would have people come to her house to get like their palms read and just to touch objects, you know, to be like, yes, your grandmother, you know, da 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 da, the money's here, whatever. you know what I mean? Like she was a psychic. Vivi has an older sister and none of those psychic abilities has ever transferred or been passed down to her older sister, but Vivi gets these hunches, these feelings, these dreams sometimes. Yeah, so she does have like a little touch, little touch of magic, if you will. Not magic in the sense like charmed per se, maybe just the Phoebe kind. But now she's a grown up woman and her best friend, the one that she saved, is a police officer. She like helps him out occasionally. She doesn't live in the town anymore, but like when she does come back into town, she will help him out occasionally and she'll go down to the police place. This time they put like items and stuff on a table and left her in there alone and she like touched the items to see if she can get a feel or a reading or something like that. And this one time there's like this bloody hair bow on the table and she like touches it to her face and it automatically brings like tears to her eyes and she's crying and she leaves a post-it note on the bow that simply just says still alive and she let Paul split out of the police department because it really affected her. Fast forward a little bit and the chief of police is really wanting to get this case solved. Like if this girl is still alive because this little girl has been dead for like 10, 11 years. And the little girl's mama is already in prison for this crime. And they have like a bunch of reasons why, but no super hard evidence or whatever. I don't understand how that works, but it's whatever. And they bring in this other cop, this like cop that has caught many people, like serial killers and the like. I'm talking like has a high count of how many cases he has solved. And this cop doesn't believe in like psychics or the unknown things that he can't see, blah, blah, blah. He's a hard ass as well. They want him to work with Vivi to find this missing girl. As of right now, 30% into the book, like Vivi didn't want to work the case because like she already doesn't like, what is the guy's name? I really suck at names. I really, really, Jesse, Jesse Sharp. And she already doesn't like him. It says she is forced to team up with Detective Jesse Sharp, a skeptic of anything but fact. When Vivi's attempts to help him close the case, put her in the crosshairs of a conspiracy theorist, theorist, theorist podcaster, she fights back with both her scientific mind and her inexplicable gifts. Can she lure a kidnapper out of hiding, find a child who haunts her, and lay some of her own ghosts to rest? And I will tell you, 
this it just gives me that charmed vibes but like not being witchy i'm pretty sure if you watch charm because you know they work with daryl who is a cop they do occasionally like help solve cases with the police and whatever because sometimes the kidnapper could low-key be a demon but like I, if you watch charm you probably get it if you watch charm i mean i'm only 30 percent in i'm only 30 percent in but I, I have a feeling I'm gonna love it. I have that feeling, you know what I mean? So I can't tell if this sharp guy is someone that he just has this really mean demeanor or if he's the bad guy. I'm, I'm like 40-ish percent in, so I don't really know. But the thing is, is I was sitting here reading this and I was like, okay, I need to come up with my guess because in these like sleuthing type books, I always like to have my guesses, right? Just to pretend, you know, that I'm Penelope Garcia. As I was reading this, I was like, one, I know it's not the parents, even though the mom is already in prison because everybody thinks that she's the one that killed her little girl. I don't think it's the parents. How do I think the little girl is alive? Yes, because I do believe in our main woman, Vivi, and her psychic abilities, and I think that she is right. But I was also thinking about Jesse, the cop. Not the best friend cop, but the, like, the bad cop. He's not a bad cop. Or is he a bad cop? He's not a bad cop. The hard ass cop that I was talking about earlier that's like on the case with Vivi, like asking Vivi for help to solve the case. The thing is, was with him, when Vivi goes to talk to the little girl's mom in prison, the little girl's mom even said that he's always up there, tries to get her to confess to things or something along those lines. And she even tells Vivi not to trust him. He just knows things. And and even Vivi is like, there's got to be a bug somewhere. Someone is telling him this info. Like, he just knows things. Like, he just knew that I was going to be here. He just knew to take me to the roof. Like, he just knows these weird things. And therefore, I'm not trusting him. I'm not trusting him. I could be wrong. Because that first when I was reading the book, I was like, ah, they're going to fall in love. They're going to fall in love. But I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that is how it goes. Maybe like they do wind up falling in love in the end and he's not the bad guy and there's something else going on. Cause then also there was like this slight mention when they went to go eat at this like restaurant bar place about the bartender having a teardrop tattooed on his face. This was towards the beginning of the book. Vivi even mentions that the teardrop is not filled in, which means that he hasn't killed someone, but he has plans to. And she got this bad feeling from him. Part of me was like, maybe he's the one. Maybe he's the kidnapper but then they like he hasn't been mentioned or brought up at all in the rest of the book so maybe that was just like you know that is my guess that is my guess and I will tell you this I am wrong a lot of the times I am wrong I just sometimes I'm not good at being a Penelope Garcia or you know a JJ or a Prue Halliwell I'm just sometimes I'm not good at things but I wish I could be so I'm still really enjoying this. Also, there was a part in this book, somebody spray painted the word witch on her car. And I was like, that is given even more charmed vibes, even though there is a sister in here. So it doesn't have the charmed vibes with like sisters working together. But if you've ever seen Charmed and they've had like a few episodes where the people find out that they're witches and they try to burn them at the stake or they vandalize their houses or like things like that. That gave me that. You know what I mean? You pro If you read this and you've watched Charmed and you don't get the feeling, I'm sorry that I was wrong in your eyes. <laughs> but in my eyes, this is making me want to watch Charmed. I need a life and some friends. <laughs> Did I mention earlier that there was also a Taylor Swift reference in this in this book? She was talking to one of her mom's old clients because they were calling and leaving voicemails and she promised her mom while her mom was dying that she would answer the voicemails. And one of the people that called her has like this phobia of going on an airplane because she thinks she's gonna crash and so Vivi was doing this whole like speech spiel thing about luck and like whatever and uh, talked about Taylor Swift and the lucky number 13. <laughs> Oh, I was coming on here to tell you before I go, which is the reason why I changed my shirt because I'm about to go mess around in the kitchen a little bit, wash some dishes, and then make some cupcakes. And I don't know what it is. 
Like we don't have a dishwasher. This is an older home, but it's been remodeled, but not remodeled enough for them to put in a dishwasher. It's kind of weird, but anyway, so I am the designated dishwasher. Typically when I go wash dishes or something, I always, never fails, get like a grease spot on my clothes. So that's why I always put back on my trusty old Maymo gowns because we're gonna go make some cupcakes. What I came on here to tell you, <laughs> to update you with on the book is I am a little over halfway through the book now and I don't think it's Jesse. I know I said a while ago that it was Jesse or I felt like it was Jesse, but at this point, I feel like if it were to be Jesse, it would be super like obvious in the sense as in, I think the author is using Jesse as a ploy to make us think that it is Jesse, to then flip the switch on us and be like, ha 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 ha, it's like Jesse's actually the good guy. Because I think Jesse is actually, I don't even know, actually no. He might not be 100, I don't know. I'm, I just, I need Jesse to tell me what his deal is <laughs> before I can make that decision. But anyway, I'm just here to sleuth around, you know what I'm saying? There has been a few scenes in here that have kind of given me the creeps, especially because like she, will sometimes like see people, not like for real, for real, but like psychically, you know what I mean? And then there's this, she, she gets home late at night one night. As they're going into the house, they see someone in the backyard and it's the next door neighbor's daughter who is hella creepy. Was like talking about a ghost that she saw. Kind of gave me chill bumps as I was reading it. So there's that. Anyway, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go make some cupcakes. Officially finished Night Will Find You by Julia Hay Haberlin. I gave it four and a half stars. The I can't tell you why it isn't a five star thriller because I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this from literally the start of the book until the very end. I really enjoyed this book. Maybe if I let it sit for a while, it might make its way up to five star, but I really enjoyed this book. And let me just say this right here, right now. Do not pick this book up and say, I picked this book up because Beth said this is like charmed. <laughs> It is nothing like charm. There are no witches. There are no three sisters that are bonded together and their grandmother dies and they're left this Victorian house. Like it's nothing like that, okay? It did give me charmed vibes in the sense that our main character does have some sort of psychic ability going on, something that she can't really hone in on all the time and it's just, it comes and goes and she is working hand in hand with a cop, similar to how the Halliwell sisters work with Daryl, that kind of stuff. So don't be like, <laughs> I picked this book up because Beth said it's like charmed, it's not. It just gave me that vibe. Anyway, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this book. I definitely think it is one for you to pick up if you like, you know, thrillers. <laughs> There are a couple of mysteries in this book. I like the characters. This book had me immersed from start to finish. I don't think there was any parts that like really dragged. I felt like it was very well paced. What else do you want from me? <laughs> this one is gonna be staying on my shelves and I'm so glad. I'm so glad I picked it up because I'm not gonna lie to you, thrillers haven't been really hitting lately. The last book that I have to read for this video is In Defense of Witches. This is a non-fiction feminist book. Um, I don't read non-fiction books like this very often. Typically the non-fiction books that I read are either true crime books or memoirs. So this will be different. I was sent this one by a publisher. So I don't know. 
in case you were wondering. And I will start that tomorrow, let you know how it goes, and then we'll wrap this thing on up. Okay, bye. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't you do it. Do not come at me with your pitchforks because, <laughs> because I'm not reading this. I am not reading this. I got a little over 30 pages into it and there were some pages I had to keep going back to like reread because I'm like, is there a point to this? Like, I feel like you're just spitting facts at me. I don't know. I'm just not a nonfiction girly and I know this. I know I'm not a nonfiction girly. Now give me nonfiction in the sense that it is a memoir and it's kind of telling us the story of someone's life that I can do. Or nonfiction in the sense that it is a true crime and it is telling us the story of said crime that I can do because it is still like in storytelling format, I guess. Maybe that is why, but books like this that is just kind of like full of facts and opinions and it's just not for me. I, I cannot make myself become interested in paying attention enough. I felt like I was back in college again trying to get through. I just, I can't do it. I'm, I'm, this is not for me. I'm DNFing it. Sorry. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to wrap up the first episode of my bookshelf ultimatum. So initially there were five books that I pulled out of my TBR jar and three of those books I did not complete, which means three of these books must be unhauled. And those three books are Salt and Stone by Victoria Scott. I read zero pages of this book. And then we have Karen White's The Night the Lights Went Out. I read just shy of 200 pages in this book. And then lastly, we have In Defense of Witches by Mona Chalet. I read 34 pages of this book. All three of these books are being unhauled. Just a little side note, I am also unhauling Fire and Flood because it is the first book in the series with Salt and Stone. If I'm not keeping Salt and Stone, there's no point in me keeping this book. This book has been read though. I read this book years ago, so it doesn't really you know, affect the amount of TBR books that I have, but just I thought I'd mention it. Another part to the ultimatum is if I read a book and the book isn't a book that I truly love, it isn't a book that I'm going to constantly be recommending or letting a friend borrow or passing down to my children or any of those categories, it too must also be unhauled. I read one book that was a two star. It's a book that I will never revisit and I probably will forget about it as soon as I'm done posting this video. And that is too good to be true. No. This one had potential, okay? It had good potential. I was wanting a good revenge plot and unfortunately it fell extremely flat. It's not for me. So this book too will be unhauled. And the final book that I read for this challenge was a book that I rated four and a half stars, a book that I do see myself recommending and loaning out to friends and rereading in the future. And that book is Night Will Find You by Julia Aberlin. I am so glad I pulled this book out of the TBR jar because if I hadn't, I don't know how long it would have taken me to pick this book up and read it. So even though this video kind of feels like a fail because I only found one good book out of the five, however, I feel like I really accomplished something. I feel like I found a new favorite. I also got rid of books that were just taking up shelf space. <laughs> essentially. Books that probably wouldn't have been picked up in the next year or two, three or four, you know what I mean? Like they would have been sitting and chilling for a while. So I'm really glad that I'm doing this and I cannot wait until the next episode which will be in April. So I hope you stick around, like and subscribe if you want to because um, I have more fun things planned. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you pick this book up and enjoy it as much as I did and until next time. Bye.